Greetings, and welcome to Flanagan's Ecologic. I am your host, Ted Flanagan, and this episode covers Econet News, Volume 25, Issue Number 8, August 2023. Quote of the Month Our transition to heat pumps is creating good paying jobs, curbing our reliance on fossil fuels, and cutting costs for Maine families all while making them more comfortable in their homes. A hat trick for the state. Maine Governor Janet Mills. Flanagan's net positive. Father of the bride. All eyes on the bride as we entered the chapel. What a thrill to be the father of the bride and to have the bride on my arm. And there was Jake at the altar, beaming like no one can beam. Loving the sight of his bride-to-be walking up the aisle flanked by her parents. We've been trained to slow pace our processional. Then the handoff, a quick kiss and hug, and I take my seat in the first pew. Like a few of us, I involuntarily tear up easily with joy. The kids' graduations and performances have triggered my tears for years. Sometimes items on the nightly news hit me. Admittedly, so damn soft I am, embarrassingly so. But I did not want to be like my dear friend Alan, who fell apart trying to toast his beloved daughter Amber's marriage. An emotional bust. That I was not going to do. Throughout the weekend, family and friends were joyous, universally comfortable with this wedding's couple match, a pairing as good as it gets. Sky and Jake are a wonderful fit of personalities, dynamic and devoted. They are both driven souls, super athletic, with big aspirations. Prior to heading to the chapel for the wedding ceremony, Sky and Jake and immediate family and witnesses gathered for the reading and signing of the ketubah, the wedding contract. Jake's father, Leonard, read the ketubah with a sincerity of deep tradition, with comfort and love. Sky and Jake are efficient project managers, and the weekend-long celebration reflected that. Every detail was covered great meals and drinks, tours and tennis. The venue was spectacular in the the heart of the Hudson River Valley. Skye's great-grandparents founded the prep school in 1931 to shape young men. They instilled a philosophy of life in them, and throughout the school community, non sibi seg cunctus, not for oneself but for all. My mom, who attended the wedding, was one year old when Millbrook School was founded. She grew up on campus. At Millbrook, every student is required to chip in to have a role in the community service. A most unusual student job at Millbrook is zoo crew. Millbrook has an accredited zoo that is open to the public. Students on zoo crew care for assigned animals. Daughter Sierra looked after endangered golden lion tamarins when she went to Millbrook. Wedding goers walked down to the zoo, crossed the bridge at its entrance, Over the rushing stream, a red panda was seen and photographed. The ceremony took place under the traditional huppa, a wedding canopy framing the couple and the officiant, Cousin Liz. Skye and Jake's voices were strong, their love and excitement so pronounced. Their vows were powerful and struck us all. I did tear up then. Some commitments were deep, others fun. Jake committed to recycling, folding at least some of his clothes, and buying an EV. At the reception, I kicked off the speeches and focused on waiting for Jake, wondering who he would be. Where's Jake? was the refrain. Was he from Laguna? From Millbrook? This guy went to college in Denver, semester abroad in New Zealand, worked in Boston, grad school in Cambridge, at every state, and as she matured, I kept wondering who would be right for Sky. Where's Jake? When would he surface, become a reality, become part of my family? Where's Jake? What a band. Long before dinner was served, and well before the speeches, most guests hit the dance floor. Then the formal program began with the bride and the groom's dance. Shortly thereafter was the father-daughter dance. We were in step and deliberately slow as we gazed into each other's eyes as we swayed and sang out, What a Wonderful World, the song made famous by Louis Armstrong. Then the aura dance, the Jewish tradition in which the newlyweds are raised in the, by the groomsmen and lifted into the air on chairs. 
The bride and groom went up and down, riding bucking broncos. Skye was not happy, later reporting that her dress was slipping and she feared a fall was imminent. Then Jake's parents, Marion and Leonard, were raised into the air. They'd clearly done this before. I tried to slip into the shadows, but then it was my turn. Oh, no. Fortunately, my chairman held a consistent angle for me, keeping me in my seat and waving a bandana in a victorious twirl. The dancing was wild, and we all cut it loose, the humidity reducing me to sweat. After the first set, Terry and I slipped off to our nearby dorm room, to switch into jeans and party shirts. Then more dancing, weaving in and out and rocking with contingents from California, Colorado, Illinois, Massachusetts, Maryland, D.C., New Mexico, North Carolina, Tennessee, Vermont, Ontario, and more. Some 175 of us gathered, witnessed, broke bread at five meals, and danced hard. So proud of Sky and Jake, their bond is spot on. The weekend was magical. They are immensely popular, and at the wedding they were showered with love. All parents attest forms of bewilderment as our offspring become full-scale beings. We witness their drive and aspirations, their moods and energies, the circle of friends they make and keep. Sky and Jake have lots of family and friends that deeply support them. What an honor to be the father of the bride. I hand off a dynamo. I gain a son. So pleased and lucky to report that I have a happy child, and thus a happy heart. Maine boasts lobsters and heat pumps. A year ago, we were reporting on Maine lobsters and sailing the Maine coast. Well, Maine is still boasting lobsters and now heat pumps. The state of Maine embraced heat pumps as part of its climate action. Heat pumps are super efficient means to heat homes. In 2019, Maine set a goal for 100,000 new heat pump installations by 2025. That goal has now been eclipsed two years early. There have been at least 104,000 installations. So Maine Governor Janet Mills is raising the bar. She's calling for another 175,000 units by 2027. The environmental benefits of pumping heat out of the air. In some seasons, what little heat there is. And condensing that heat cannot be overlooked. A Rocky Mountain Institute study found that heat pumps generate less than a tenth the emissions of conventional gas furnaces. The state of Maine has around three quarters of a million housing units, 751,782 in 2022, thus 100,000 heat pump installations. While some homes will have more than one unit, represents a significant percentage of homes. Emissions from residential heating is 17% of Maine's total GHG footprint. Thus, heat pumps are poised to be a part of the solution in Maine, while saving the state's 1.4 million residents money as they adopt this efficient technology. Better yet is what Maine and other cold-weather states are proving about heat pumps. Contrary to the popular belief that heat pumps don't work in cold climates, Mainers are proving that they do. They can eliminate fossil-fueled forms of heating throughout the country without restriction year-round. Efficiency Maine, which administers Maine's heat pump rebate programs, reports that it is tracking consumer satisfaction with heat pumps, where wind chill temperatures hit minus 60 degrees last year. One 36-hour deep freeze in December of 22 had overnight lows of negative 18 degrees F and daytime highs of only 0 degrees Fahrenheit. Thousands of heat pump users were surveyed and reported that they were comfortable and warm. Heat pumps were able to maintain desired temperatures, according to Elephant Energy, a home decarbonization company. And they were saving money too. One couple spent $100 to heat their home between November and April. They said that using an oil furnace would have cost them $3,000. BTS takes on coal. There's a long stretch of beach at Mangbang in the east coast of South Korea that was the site of a famous photo shoot for the K-pop band BTS. It's known as Butter Beach, and it's become a pilgrimage site for BTS devotees. To their shock and dismay, a gigantic coal plant is under construction just a few miles away. The 2.1 gigawatt plant has become a flashpoint for concern over the country's continued use of fossil fuels. BTS fans and the broader K-pop community 
had been galvanized by the desecration of the land near Butter Beach and are now speaking out. There is a growing legion of K-pop fans that state that we believe we have the power and influence to tackle the most devastating issue of our time, climate change. The protest group K-pop for Plant formed with non-profit Korea Beyond Coal. Its members realize that their action will not be able to stop the Butter Beach plant, technically in Samchok in the Gangwon province. But their action may well influence South Korea's President Yoon suk Yeol and his climate change policies. To date, he has favored nuclear and coal and buying carbon offsets over solar and wind developments in Korea. Fully 7.3 gigawatts of new, new coal is expected to come online in Korea between 2020 and 2025. Now an album cover, the desecration of a beach featured by BTS, has ignited community action. Having K-pop fans on board has taken the anti-coal campaign to the next level in South Korea, with unprecedented internet coverage and global attention. Seven majors form the Charging Coalition. The Charging Coalition was announced in mid-July. Seven major auto companies have come together. They are joining forces to deploy at least 30,000 fast chargers across America on U.S. highways and other public sites. That would nearly double the 32,000 fast chargers now deployed as of July 2023. BMW, General Motors, Honda, Hyundai, Kia, Mercedes-Benz, and Stellantis have formed the joint venture to do so. These companies believe that the country's existing fast charging network remains woefully insufficient to support the millions of EVs likely to hit U.S. roads in the coming years. The Biden administration has a goal for EVs to be half of new car sales by 2030. While most will be charged with level 2 chargers at homes and at apartment complexes, NREL projects a need for 182,000 fast chargers to support the 30 to 42 million EVs anticipated to be on the road by 2030. Mary Barra, GM's CEO, noted that GM's commitment to an all-electric future is focused not only on delivering EVs to our customers, but investing in charging and working across the industry to make it more accessible. She noted that the better the experience, the faster that the EV market will grow. Porsche's Charging Lounges Porsche has opened the first of its EV charging lounges. It is looking to upgrade the charging experience for Porsche EV drivers with exclusive premium amenities, such as free snacks and soft drinks, digital media, high-performance Wi-Fi, and even a smart mirror for a quick workout. The pilot site is outside Bingham am Rhein, Germany. Porsche plans to open its own network of fast charging stations across Europe's most important routes, offering its drivers the charging experience that one expects of the brand. At the pilot site, there are six 300 kW fast chargers and four 22 kW AC charging ports. Next year, Porsche may offer 400 kW super fast chargers. Payments can be made through Apple or Google Pay. The current price is 33 cents per kilowatt hour. One needs a Porsche ID to access the charging lounge. The pilot location is open 24-7 and is in an area where there is significant traffic. The Porsche charging lounges will be displayed in the Porsche navigation system. The facility uses no fossil fuels. It has solar panels on the roof. More lounges are slated for Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. So far, Porsche's charging network consists of 436,000 charging ports in over 20 countries throughout the European Union. The company plans for 80% of its lineup to be EVs by 2030. Currently, the company only has one EV for sale, its Taycan, noted recently for falling sales. Powering Rivian's Adventure Network Rivian is not only making waves with its SUV, but now is backing a massive solar plant in Kentucky that is being built atop an abandoned coal mine. Rivian is the solar plant's anchor customer, signing a 100-megawatt PPA with Bright Knight, the plant's developer. Rivian plans to use the power to supply its proprietary EV charging network, its adventure network, of public fast-charging stations. Rivian is committed to sourcing clean energy to do so. 
its officials claim that the Bright Night deal is a highly economic PPA. The solar project will provide enough power for 450 million miles of Rivian EV driving every year. One of the reasons that Rivian was so interested in the plant is that it met the criteria of the Nature Conservancy's Clean Energy Development Framework. The framework, presented in a report called Carbon Free, a framework for purpose-led renewable energy, embraces three Cs, communities, conservation, and climate, not just least cost power. Projects should have strong community support, employ diverse local workforces, and incur location economic and community benefits. In this case, Bright Night's use of reclaimed land, the project's workforce development and economic renewal benefits, make it an attractive project to Rivian. Symbolic indeed, the solar farm sits atop the site of an abandoned coal mine. The 800 megawatt Bright Night solar farm will be situated on reclaimed land at the Starfire Coal Mine, a surface mining operation dating back to the 1960s that cropped rolling Appalachian mountaintops into a series of leveled plateaus. Mining continues in one corner of the parcel. Bright Night plans to cover 7,000 acres with solar panels starting in 2027 and completing the entire project by 2030. It's big. The planned billion-dollar solar installation will be the largest renewable plant at an abandoned mine. It may be the largest solar project east of the Mississippi. The project will employ around 250 workers during its construction phases, and Bright Night is committed to worker training for locals that have been hurt by the mine's closure. The solar plant will provide a major boost to the region's tax base, while its developers will tap the IRA's special benefits for projects located in former coal communities. Rural Electrification, Yellow in Africa Pay-as-you-go, P-A-Y-G, is now common in the developing world. For those without access to power or access to phones or the Internet, PAYG microfinancing systems are invaluable. They're affordable. Let's, exam- let's examine one company's most popular offering. Yellow provides a small home solar system that consists of a 10-watt solar panel, a 50-watt-hour battery, four lights, a cell phone charger, and a radio. For these small systems, users make a $10 deposit and then pay off the balance in 6 to 24 months. Yellow was founded in 2018 in Malawi by Michael Hayink and Maya Stewart. They saw a need. Malawi is a country marked by among the lowest access to electricity in the world. Yellow proudly boasts that it provides, provides access to products and services that improve the quality of life of its customers. Yellow's purpose is to make life better for customers living in Africa. It now finances and solar and digital devices like cell phones in Malawi, as well as Madagascar, Rwanda, Uganda, and Zambia. Through its digital technology platform, Yellow enables a distributed network of sales agents to serve rural households with life-changing products and services. It has 160 employees. To finance Yellow, its managers have raised $45 million in the past 10 years, enabling its business model. According to Gogla World Bank report, there has been $2.3 billion investments in startups such as Yellow for solar energy financing serving the off-grid sector. They operate pay-go models, asset-based financing. The solar kits and lantern products are hugely, pub- are hugely popular in sub-Saharan Africa, a region where millions are off the grid, a region that accounts for 75% of the world's population without electricity. One of the largest providers is M. Copa. See Econet News, Volume 12, Issue Number 7. More news from Africa. The President of Kenya, His Excellency William Ruto, recently inaugurated a new Rome electrical, electric motorcycle manufacturing plant. Founded in 2017, Rome is the leader, leading provider of EVs in Africa. It is the first company to deliver locally produced electric motorcycles and buses, leading the transition to sustainable transportation in Africa. Overlooking the Nairobi National Park, The Rome Park is a new and expansive 108,000 square foot facility that will produce 50,000 motorcycles each year. 
His Excellency noted that, I am proud to inaugurate Rome's electric motorcycle plant today. This facility showcases Kenya's potential as a leader in clean transportation solutions in Africa. That's it. Thanks for listening to Flanagan's Ecologic. We'll see you next time.